tonight on 2020. If you were a Scientologist, usually when you leave something, you are one of the relative few that hold the answers. You don't have an organization attacking you. That all humankind depend upon. Following you. You mean something like this? Having a stranger lurk around a quiet residential street in West Allis, Wisconsin? The people down here called the cops and they said, listen, there's a guy out here looking in a house and we think he might be a drug dealer. The police are called in only to make an eye-popping discovery. The mystery man's rented SUV looks like an arsenal on wheels, loaded with handguns, rifles, ammo, a stun gun, a high zoom camera, and a satellite computer. That sounds like this guy's going to war. It sounds like he's a hitman, doesn't it? That man, Dwayne Powell, swears he's not a hitman. Instead, he says he's a $10,000 a week private eye with a very famous client. The company I work for is huge. So why are they spying on this 80-year-old man who plays the horn for a living? What kind of super dark secret world is this you get yourself involved in? I have never met a more competent, a more intelligent, a more tolerant, a more compassionate being. A story that affects every Scientologist. Scientology. Powell says the church is his client. And his target, the estranged father of David Miscavige, the church's all-powerful, wildly controversial leader. When somebody enrolls, consider he's joined for the duration. Tonight, the explosive new book that's causing a he said, they said between one man and the church he left behind. It was an escape. You think you can just walk out? No. It's not just that he decided to write a book. He decided to tell a false story a deafening crack in Scientology's royal family. David is backstage, literally tearing me apart verbally, cursing, yelling, screaming at me. When he's screaming at you, do you ever think, I changed this guy's diapers? How ex-members now depict Gold Base, the church's mountainside paradise, Scientology style, gated with tight security. They say, your mail is checked, that your phone calls are monitored. Is any of this true? Well, some of that is true, but that doesn't make it a prison. Tonight, the story the church doesn't want you to hear. I raised him, and to come to this, what the hell is this? This is nuts. A father's story. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir, right here tonight, the ABC News exclusive. As a father now faces off against his very own son, and not just any son, but the powerful leader of the Church of Scientology, David Miscavige, revered by some, reviled by others. And now the subject of a blockbuster new book titled Ruthless, which comes out next Tuesday. The publishers tell us that lawyers from the church ask them not to release it. So what's in it that has the church on high alert? Dan Harris finds out. You have written a whole book about your son and you've called the book Ruthless. Yeah. It's a pretty damning charge to level against your own child. He wasn't always that way. When he was a kid, I am telling you, he was a lovable kid. Ron Miscavige says long before his son became the almighty leader of one of the most controversial new religions on the planet. How much must one do to call themselves a Scientologist? Before all those speeches to cheering crowds of believers, and before all that elbow rubbing with celebrity Scientologists such as Tom Cruise, John Travolta, and Kirstie Alley, David was just a regular kid growing up in this middle-class neighborhood in Willingboro, New Jersey. They had four kids over there. Phyllis and Gil had two girls. Aluminum siding, public swimming pools, children bicycling in the street. Ron, a salesman and aspiring musician, is raising four kids with his wife, Loretta, the oldest, Ronnie, David and his twin sister, Denise, and their younger sister, Lori. So you spent 12 years right here on the street? 12 years right here, yeah. Ron says young David was a strong student with an even stronger will. David's not a big kid. Not at all. And yet he was getting into fights. He's a tough kid. I mean, for his size, he's like a stick of dynamite, you know? In your book, you describe him having a habit of saying not so kind things about other people, even as a boy. Yeah. It seems to me from reading your book, to you, in hindsight, that's a bit of a red flag. It was a bit of a red flag in hindsight. 
But at home, it's not as if Ron himself is receiving world's greatest dad coffee mugs on Father's Day. Marriage-wise, we didn't have a great marriage at all. We had strife, and there was some domestic abuse, which I don't ever feel good about, and I don't think you can make excuses for that no matter what or how much time goes by. When you, when you say domestic abuse, what do you oh, mean? I, I, I used to I'd strike her. I'd hit her in the arm or something like that. In front of the kids? And in front of the kids, yeah. Ron's mea culpas notwithstanding, the church says his acts of domestic violence are much more serious and more frequent than he admits. In fact, the church says the book, co-written by another former church member who's now a fierce critic of church management, is filled with half-truths and outright lies. It's, in, in my view, a literary forgery. The church rarely grants on-camera interviews, but it's taking Ron's book so seriously that it dispatched attorney Monique Yingling to discredit the author. What has David Miscavige's response been to this book? I think he's, on a personal level, I think he's, he's probably very, very sad that his father would do this. There seems to be no explanation except that his father is trying to make a buck uh, off of his name. This unusual family history and subsequent family feud was set in motion in 1968 when Ron first hears the word Scientology at a business meeting. What was it about the word Scientology that got you so interested? I don't know, but it did. All I heard was Scientology, and I thought, what is that? Ron soon learns that Scientology is a new religion founded by the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. There are certain evils in society which definitely should cease, and we are taking some responsibility for them. So I went to a place where there was a guy who was teaching Scientology. He would do drills to teach you better communication. So it was useful for you, I would imagine, as a salesman yeah. and also as a guy who was in a marriage that had a lot of arguments uh, oh, yeah. involved. Yeah. And he says Scientology works wonders for him. Soon he starts paying for one of the central practices of the faith, a sort of counseling called auditing that uses a Scientology device called an e-meter. Look, I didn't know what I was looking for. I knew I was looking for something. And when I got in Scientology, I felt that I found what I was looking for, which did have a lot of answers to life on a basic level. So many answers, so many life-changing benefits, Ron feels a duty as a parent to introduce his son David to Scientology as well. He hopes that somehow the auditing can help with his son's biggest problem, a nasty and recurring case of asthma. He would get severe attacks. These must have been terrifying episodes for you as a dad. That's putting it mildly. And so it comes to pass that in 1969, at the tender age of nine, David Miscavige has his first auditing session. About 45 minutes later, David walks out, smiling, bright. And in that moment, the future is born, a future of fame and power as David Miscavige rises to the highest levels of Scientology and a future of turmoil and pain as his family life erupts into a civil war. So you think that was the key turning point in his whole life? I know it. Behold his mighty hand! Miracles, as commonly understood in the Judeo-Christian tradition, are not a big part of Scientology theology, a modern doctrine which draws not from ancient scripture, but instead from the mind of its founder, the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. This is the critically panned movie version of Hubbard's novel, Battlefield Earth. It starred noted Scientologist John Travolta. Send some guards out and round them up. But back in New Jersey, Ron Miscavige says something close to what Christians might call faith healing occurs in 1969. That's when he takes his undersized, asthmatic nine-year-old son, David, for his first session of auditing, a kind of Scientology counseling. About 45 minutes later, David walks out, smiling, bright. That's what happened. He says, Dad, it's handled. So your view at the time was that his asthma was cured by, by Scientology? Let's put it this way. It mitigated it considerably. I think it was at that moment that he decided he's going to do something with this. So you think that was the key turning point in his whole life? I know it. I know it. 
According to Ron, this moment is a sort of conversion experience for the entire family. Now everybody starts studying Scientology, with David setting himself apart as something of a prodigy. What do you think he was getting out of it? Satisfaction that he was helping somebody. This is my kind of losers. By the year 1975, Ron's music career hits a high note. He even Absolutely. puts out this rather groovy album. While David's Scientology career is really taking off, he's now a young auditor, and he decides to join the church's priestly order, the Sea Organization, or Sea Org. The group's distinctive look, medals, gold ribbons, and dressed whites were modeled in part on Hubbard's own time in the U.S. Navy. He said, I want to go and help L. Ron Hubbard. And I thought to myself, hey, I'd be pretty proud of him. So I said, OK, I'll help you whatever I can. David heads to Scientology's spiritual headquarters in Clearwater, Florida, which involves signing a billion-year contract, meaning you agree to work for the Sea Org in your future lives. While in Clearwater, he meets Lois Riesdorf, who says she recruits David to join the Commodore's Messenger Organization, L. Ron Hubbard's personal elite unit within the Sea Org. He was very, if, if I could say, um, gung-ho, had a lot of spark. When he was 16, he was a climber. He wanted to be at the top. And he gained a reputation of being really tough, like you didn't mess with him. Pretty soon, David finds himself in the orbit of the founder, L. Ron Hubbard, who has gone from writing science fiction to writing volumes of sacred Scientology texts. Teenage David moves west without his family, where Hubbard, sometimes known by his initials LRH, is building secret new bases and shooting Scientology training films. Dave ended up being a cameraman, but in the beginning, we used to call him the kid and LRH would call him the kid. While Ron Miscavige is back east selling cookware and cutlery, what his son is doing during this period of time is a matter of intense dispute. The church is adamant that Hubbard decided early that David Miscavige would eventually succeed him. There never ever was any doubt whatsoever that Mr. Hubbard intended Mr. David Miscavige to be the leader of the religion after he had departed this life. That's not how Lois Riesdorf remembers it. She says Hubbard wanted the church to be run by a committee after he died, not one person. But Riesdorf says after Hubbard goes into seclusion in 1980, Miscavige's influence and power grow unchecked as he evolves from the Commodore's messenger into a gatekeeper. He started to get power and started to pull in people onto his side. And it ended up being like a coup, where you had half of the management took over and kicked out the other half. Riesdorf says she is part of that other half and that she's relieved of her executive duties. It was a betrayal. In the book, you say that your son really developed a taste for power in the Sea Org. There were no checks and balances on him at, at a certain point where he could just go ahead. He just assumed that power. The church says neither Lois Riesdorf who they say was expelled in 1982 by Hubbard personally, nor Ron have first-hand knowledge of these events. Instead, they point out that during this time period, Ron is dealing with his own serious issues. In 1985, Ron is arrested in Pennsylvania and charged with attempted rape, which Ron says is a case of mistaken identity. David arranges for his father's defense. He said, listen, you're not on your own. They're going to take on the whole Church of Scientology. The charges are dropped after a pretrial hearing. And after it's all over, Ron says he owes it to the church to join the Sea Org himself. I could have possibly been convicted of something that I didn't do and end up going to jail. I feel I have to help him. David told him that his father needed to turn his life around. Despite the fact that in a 2012 article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, the church called Ron the victim in this case, Scientology officials are now playing a different tune, accusing Ron of deliberately playing down the seriousness of the charges. The church has gone from calling Ron Miscavige a victim, in the words of the church, to now raising questions about whether he's whitewashing the whole thing. So the only thing that's changed between now and then that I'm aware of is that Ron decided to write a book. Well, it's not just that he decided to write a book. He decided to tell a false story. 
What is not in dispute is that in 1985, Ron moves to California, divorces his wife, and dons the uniform of the Sea Org. And Ron says shortly after coming aboard, he sees that his son has changed. And I saw him, I says, hey, Dave. And he turned to me and he looked at me like, who are you talking to? No words were said, but that glance told me those days were over. I would never, I could never do that as a father to a son. In 1986, David Miscavige announces a seismic event for the church. L. Ron Hubbard has died. The being we knew as L. Ron Hubbard still exists. However, the body he had could no longer serve his purposes. The next year, David officially becomes the head of the church, taking the title chairman of the board. He is now alone at the top. From now on, he will be the star of the church's Olympic-sized celebration. He will lead the church through some of its greatest triumphs, like winning its tax-exempt status. The IRS issued letters recognizing Scientology, and every one of its organizations has fully tax-exempt. The war is over! And he will spearhead the charge to bring celebrities into the fold. Were you around when Tom was joining the church, and was it a high priority for your son? It was top priority. who plays the horn for a living. What kind of super dark secret world is this you get yourself involved in? I have never met a more competent, a more intelligent, a more tolerant, a more compassionate being. A story that affects every Scientologist. Scientology. Powell says the church is his client, and his target the estranged father of David Miscavige, the church's all-powerful, wildly controversial leader. When somebody enrolls, consider he's joined for the duration. Tonight, the explosive new book that's causing a he said, they said between one man and the church he left behind. It was an escape. You think you can just walk out? No. It's not just that he decided to write a book, he decided to tell a false story. A deafening crack in Scientology's royal family. David is backstage, literally tearing me apart verbally, cursing, yelling, screaming at me. Is raising four kids with his wife, Loretta, the oldest, Ronnie, David and his twin sister, Denise, and their younger sister, Lori. So you spent 12 years right here on the street? 12 years right here, yeah. Ron says young David was a strong student with an even stronger will. David's not a big kid. Not at all. And yet he was getting into fights. He's a tough kid. I mean, for his size, he's like a stick of dynamite, you know? In your book, you describe him having a habit of saying not so kind things about other people, even as a boy. Yeah. It seems to me from reading your book, to you, in hindsight, that's a bit of a red flag. It was a bit of a red flag in hindsight. But at home, it's not as if Ron himself is receiving world's greatest dad coffee mugs on Father's Day. Marriage-wise, we didn't have a great marriage at all. We had strife, and there was some domestic abuse, which I don't ever feel good about, and I don't think you can make excuses for that no matter what or how much time goes. When he's screaming at you, do you ever think, I changed this guy's diapers? How ex-members now depict Gold Base, the church's mountainside paradise, Scientology style, gated with tight security. They say, your mail is checked that your phone calls are monitored. Is any of this true? Well, some of that is true, but that doesn't make it a prison. Tonight, the story the church doesn't want you to hear. I raised him, and to come to this, what the hell is this? This is nuts. A father's story. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. Right here tonight, the ABC News exclusive. As a father now faces off against his very own son, and not just any son, but the powerful leader of the Church of Scientology, David Miscavige. Revered by some, reviled by others. And now the subject of a blockbuster new book titled Ruthless, which comes out next Tuesday. The publishers tell us that lawyers from the church ask them not to release it. So what's in it that has the church on? Tonight on 2020, if you were a Scientologist, usually when you leave something, you are one of the relative few that hold the answers. You don't have 
an organization attacking you. That all humankind depend upon. Following you. You mean something like this? Having a stranger lurk around a quiet residential street in West Allis, Wisconsin? The people down here called the cops and they said, listen, there's a guy out here looking in a house and we think he might be a drug dealer. The police are called in only to make an eye-popping discovery. The mystery man's rented SUV looks like an arsenal on wheels, loaded with handguns, rifles, ammo, a stun gun, a high zoom camera, and a satellite computer. That sounds like this guy's going to war. It sounds like he's a hitman, doesn't it? That man, Dwayne Powell, swears he's not a hitman. Instead, he says he's a $10,000 a week private eye with a very famous client. The company I work for is huge. So why are they spying on this 80-year-old man who... High alert. Dan Harris finds out. You have written a whole book about your son, and you've called the book Ruthless. Yeah. It's a pretty damning charge to level against your own child. He wasn't always that way. When he was a kid, I am telling you, he was a lovable kid. Ron Miscavige says long before his son became the almighty leader of one of the most controversial new religions on the planet. How much must one do to call themselves a Scientologist? Before all those speeches to cheering crowds of believers, and before all that elbow rubbing with celebrity Scientologists such as Tom Cruise, John Travolta, and Kirstie Alley, David was just a regular kid growing up in this middle-class neighborhood in Willingboro, New Jersey. They had four kids over there. Phyllis and Gil had two girls. Aluminum siding, public swimming pools, children bicycling in the street. Ron, a salesman and aspiring musician, tonight on 2020. If you were a Scientologist, usually when you leave something, you are one of the relative few that hold the answers. You don't have an organization attacking you. That all humankind depend upon. Following you. You mean something like this? Having a stranger lurk around a quiet residential street in West Allis, Wisconsin? The people down here called the cops and they said, listen, there's a guy out here looking in a house. That affects every Scientologist. Scientology. Powell says the church is his client and his target the estranged father of David Miscavige, the church's all-powerful, wildly controversial leader. When somebody enrolls, consider he's joined for the duration. Tonight, the explosive new book that's causing a he said, he says he's a $10,000 a week private eye with a very famous client. The company I work for is huge. So why are they spying on this 80-year-old man who plays the horn for a living? A super dark secret world is this you get yourself involved in. I have never met a more competent, a more intelligent, a more tolerant, a more compassionate being. House, and we think he might be a drug dealer. The police are called in only to make an eye-popping discovery. The mystery man's rented SUV looks like an arsenal on wheels, loaded with handguns, rifles, ammo, a stun gun, a high zoom camera, and a satellite computer. That sounds like this guy's going to war. It sounds like he's a hitman, doesn't it? That man, Dwayne Powell, swears he's not a hitman. Instead, he, they said between one man and the church you, he left behind. It was an escape. You think you can just walk out? No. It's not just that he decided to write a book. He decided to tell a false story. A deafening crack in Scientology's royal family. David is backstage literally tearing me apart verbally. Cursing, yelling, screaming at me. When he's screaming at you, do you ever think, I changed this guy's diapers?